Welcome to Living Hope. In today's message, I am the light, Dr. McLuhan explores the unique claim of Jesus to be the light of the world. Fifty years ago, I had an experience in the Holy Spirit that changed how I understand or what I understand about the heart of God on reaching people who have been resistant to him for many, many years. I was called to the bedside of a dying man to share the message of Jesus with him. Many people had attempted to share the message with him. <clears throat> this actually happened on a return visit to South Africa. I was a young student in Bible college and was eager to share the message. By the grace of God, the man was ready to receive the message I had to share. He was an engineer. He had no need for God in his life. He had worked on very and many very prestigious projects. I could name them for you. <clears throat> but he, he was unwilling to listen to the message of Jesus. Something must have happened in his childhood or in his earthly journey or in his church experience. And sometimes when people get out of college, they just run away from God completely, forget their roots. It may have been his story. I don't even know what his story is. I just know that I got asked to come and see him, and he said yes. With an open Bible, I explained how Jesus came to pay for his sins. Didn't matter what you had done or what anybody had done, Jesus was quite willing to forgive everyone for everything. As I shared with him, the Spirit of God touched Mr. Clinton Parker. He understood his need for salvation. And he was willing to ask Jesus to forgive him. He prayed with me to receive Jesus as his Savior. It was a very special moment for me. But of course, it was much more special for him and for his family who had prayed for him for many years. As I got up from the room, he said, uh, from the bed to leave the room, he said, would you just wait a minute? I have a question that I want to ask you. The whole time that you were speaking to me, a light was shining from your Bible and coming directly into my face. I didn't see the light. He saw the light. And he said, could you tell me what that light was? As I shared with Mr. Parker these words of Jesus, I am the light of the world, Jesus said. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John chapter 12 uh, chapter 8 and verse 12. On that day, the light of Jesus shined upon Mr. Parker and the darkness of his heart could no longer resist the light of Jesus. And this story illustrates today's powerful saying of Jesus, I am the light. And Jesus is the brightest beacon of light, the offering hope and direction to all the people of the world. The Apostle John introduced Jesus to us using this uh, symbol, this, uh, this not metaphor, but this actuality of, of uh, Jesus as being the light. He spoke about the light of Jesus more than any other writer in the New Testament. Now listen to how John begins his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he was in the beginning with God. John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. It's a remarkable statement. Maybe we've gotten too accustomed to it to consider just how deep the statement is. John clearly understood that Jesus pre-existed his birth in Bethlehem. John says, in the beginning was the word. He's not talking about the Bible. He's talking about Jesus. John had no doubt in his mind about this. He says, John was with God, or Jesus was with God. Jesus is divine. Jesus was not only before creation. Jesus himself was co-creator with God. It's huge. All things, John wrote, were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was life, and the life was the light of men. 
The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. There's no amount of darkness that can put out the light of a single match. Darkness is no match for a match. Light always expels darkness. This is great news. No matter how dark the world gets, there's no amount of darkness that can never extinguish the light of Jesus. No matter how dark your life is, no matter how difficult your days are, there is always light that can lead you forward. You don't have to wait for light at the end of the tunnel. There's light in the tunnel. <laughs> it may seem dark, but it's actually light. May God open your eyes to see the light that you need to see. And I believe that there are people listening to this message who are experiencing what Mr. Parker experienced, the light of Jesus is shining upon you to open your eyes to see the truth about who he is. Now John transitions from this glorious picture of the past, this glorious pre-creation picture to the reality that you and I face every day in our lives. John tells us that God prepared the world to know Jesus through a prophetic ministry of a man called John the Baptist. John chapter 1, verse 6 and 8, God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell us about the light so everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. Can you tell that John's just so caught up with the word light? He lived in a dark time, and Jesus came to bring light. John continued by saying, the one who is the true light gives light to everyone who was coming into the world. He came into the world, the very world he created, but the world did not recognize him. Everyday people write to me who have clearly have no recognition of Jesus, and people like to bomb my page and say awful things by bomb. I just mean write nasty things on my page. I, I didn't mean that literally. And I write back and I just say, you know, my experience is so different than yours. Jesus speaks to me. I hear his voice. His spirit of God lives inside of me. He fills me. People are healed when I pray. I wish you could know God the way I do. You know, I've had people write to me and said, you didn't see Jesus. You saw the devil. <laughs> and that's what they did to Jesus. They accused Jesus of being the devil. And then you know people like that are just living in darkness. And we're praying today that as people who are like that would find this message and hear the truth that Jesus is light. I like to say to people, you know, I can tell the difference between a devil and Jesus because I've cast a lot of devils out. And Jesus didn't look like a devil when he spoke to me. And Jesus won't look like a devil when he speaks to you. He'll take the devil out of you and put himself in you. John continued his gospel to tell us the stories of a wide variety of people whose lives were touched by Jesus, some intentionally and some accidentally. That's how it is as we live, you know. We can intentionally visit with people and we can accidentally meet people in the course of living who need to hear this glorious truth. And so today we'll look at two very brief stories, the story of a religious man by the name of Nicodemus and then a lady who was considered to be a sinful woman, the two extremes of society that Jesus was not afraid to interact with the religious or with people who are considered untouchable or people to stay away from. And so let's talk about this religious leader, Nicodemus, such an amazing person, an honest person, uh, it's strange for religious people to be honest, isn't it? They usually have a facade of righteousness, but not honesty. This, uh, this man was fascinated by the presence and power that was manifested in the life of Jesus. And so he came to Jesus with this opening statement, very unusual. Rabbi, we all know he's a Pharisee. Rabbi, we all know... We've been talking behind closed doors about you, and we all know God sent you. 
God sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evident or evidence that God is with you. Now, that's a remarkable admission from the group that will eventually crucify Jesus. But they are without excuse because they had previously discussed and understood the only way to say it's not from God is to say it's from the devil. Nicodemus didn't buy it. And so he comes to Jesus and says, Rabbi, you do stuff I can't do. You do remarkable things, and that means God is with you. And this is what God is doing all around the world. God, Nicodemus understood that miracles are one of the great ways that God uses to open the hearts of people who have been resistant to the message of Jesus. And we have seen this over and over through the world. We wouldn't have to go any further than the Apostle Paul to know that a man who did everything to destroy it is encountered by the presence of Jesus and everything changes. And that story is repeated over and over and over. I've met so many people like that overseas who were just encountered by the presence of Jesus against their will. <laughs> Sometimes we say the gentleman, the Holy Spirit's a gentleman, he won't force you. That uh, I don't think is exactly true. Uh, the Holy Spirit has put enough pressure on me <laughs> to make sure I knew God's way was better than my way. If you're feeling pressure from heaven, yield to it. And if you've never yielded yourself to Jesus, ask God to open your eyes to see who he is. The enemies of Jesus <clears throat> become some of his best friends. After their loved ones are healed by the power of Jesus. A friend of mine was in, uh, in Turkey on one of the holidays of, of another group. And just sharing the message of Jesus. A man was really resistant. And my friend just turned to him and he says, you have a daughter, don't you? She's six years old. And the man said, yes, I do. And she's very sick right now. But God will heal her. He allowed the man to pray for her. His daughter was healed, and he gave his heart to Jesus. The one thing that I've learned is to not ask people if they're Christians or not Christians before I pray for healing. If people want to be healed. Jesus healed people from every different background. He never said, are you coming to synagogue? Are you going to temple? He never asked any religious questions. He just let people experience his presence and his power. And after that, hearts and lives and minds are changed. If we could do one thing with you to walk away from this service that would be so helpful is we got to get healing out of the church. <laughs> I've said it so many times. There's usually too much unbelief in a church for people to be healed. There's more belief out on the streets. <laughs> Talk to people and they've said to me, let's see what your God can do. Game on. You can encourage people to say, let's see what your God can do. And then we let God do what only God can do. And hearts are changed. We don't ask religious questions. We just ask, can I pray? Would you have any objection to me praying in the name of Jesus? People are healed. <clears throat> Someone watching this message is just like that. You're deeply religious. But your religion has been unable to heal your daughter. I command your daughter to be healed right now. Fever go. Cancer go right now in the name of Jesus. Mister, just say to your daughter, just say these words. Jesus heals you right now. You don't have to believe in Jesus. Just say it. Jesus heals you. And the power of God will flow through your hands to touch your daughter. If God just healed your daughter by his power, write to me and let me know what God has done for you. Now, Jesus talked to people from every level of society. That was at the high end, religious end. <clears throat> Not all of us are qualified to talk to people at that level. Uh, very few conversations I have at that level, but occasionally God brings me into a circumstance where we can talk to people. And many of us are afraid to talk to people on the lower end of society. It's interesting that in this story, the people at the upper end tried to take Jesus in a trap on the lower end. Isn't that interesting? 
There was nothing they could do for the lower end because they wouldn't touch him, couldn't be around him. They were too holy. They would be unclean if they came in contact with her. And yet somehow they apprehended her physically and brought her to Jesus. Can you imagine how hard your heart must be to do that? And so the story continues uh, uh, about this lady who was caught in the act of adultery. <clears throat> now, if you're caught in the act of adultery, there had to be two people. You can't commit adultery alone. But this religious group just brought one of the parties to Jesus. That shows you a lot right there. <clears throat> and they wanted his opinion. Religious people always want your opinion. People ask me all the time who I think about this and that re religious leader. <clears throat> So we find this story in John chapter 8. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst of him, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught. Now they wanted to know what Jesus thought should be done. They quoted the law. I'm not going to take the time to talk about all of that because they weren't interested in the law. They were interested in trying to get Jesus to throw a stone. You can't get Jesus to throw a stone at people you want to throw a stone at. <laughs> You're wasting your time. So they thought they found a way to trap Jesus. And Jesus did something that the religious leaders could never have seen coming. And that's how Jesus is. He'll run around you. He'll have an end run that will catch you completely off guard and surprise you with the presence of the Holy Spirit. So after writing a few words on the ground, nobody knows what he wrote. Famously, Jesus stood up and said, let him who is without the first sin, or without sin, throw the first stone. Yeah. And <laughs> there's a lot of sermons on what Jesus wrote. <clears throat> Doesn't matter. Whatever he did impacted the people who saw it. And when they heard it, he didn't say it, they heard it in their minds, what they saw with their eyes. They went out one by one, beginning with the older one, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Now, who would have ever thought of something like that? Only Jesus. Because Jesus is not into judging. Jesus is into delivering. He's into helping people, wherever they are, find a new lease on life on that day. Jesus called the lady out of her darkness and into his glorious light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And whatever darkness you are in, you don't have to find a way to get yourself out of it to get into the light. The light will come into you and the darkness will go. Just right where you are, we release a burst of light from heaven come upon you. May the light of heaven come into the darkness of your cell, into the darkness of your circumstance, into the darkness of your hospital, into the darkness of your marriage, into the darkness of your financial mess, into the darkness of whatever you are facing. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. It's a terrible thing to walk in darkness. It does not matter if the darkness is rooted in religion or rooted in in rebellion its impact is the same darkness is a way of leading us to make poor decisions so invite the light of Jesus to come out to bring you out of your dark corner and into his loving light <clears throat> Jesus came to fulfill the words of Isaiah Jesus filled so many words and Isaiah had more fulfilled prof prophecies in the life of Jesus, I think, than just about any other prophet. Isaiah said, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. And for those who live <clears throat> in a land of deep darkness, the light will shine. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 2, clearly a reference uh, to Jesus and to his impact as you read on in the text, it's related to Galilee and, of course, to the larger ministry that Jesus had. To not see that Jesus is the light confirms the words of Isaiah 
that Satan has bound people to not see who Jesus really is. And just feel like as you've been listening today, a shift has been happening both in the house and for those watching us around the world. You, you're seeing Jesus in a new light. I can't do that, but it's the Holy Spirit who's working in your heart and life. This is what Isaiah went on to say. He will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all the people, the veil that is spread over all the nations. We lift the veil today. <clears throat> I lift the veil off of you. I lift it off of you so that you can see more clearly than you've ever seen before exactly who Jesus is. Now, it was my privilege to be with Mr. Clinton Parker one more time before he passed away. And during that visit, he expressed to me regret about having lived his whole life under the veil of darkness. <laughs> and I said, Mr. Parker, I'll tell your story. And I've been telling his story for 50 years. And God has been lifting veils off of people to see who Jesus is. <laughs> if you regularly listen to our messages, then you will know that just recently I shared this story. And you may be wondering why I'm sharing it again. And there's a good reason, because just two weeks ago, it happened again. I was called to the bedside of a man in our neighborhood who was passing away. He'd suffered many years with cancer, and I had known him for many, many years. <clears throat> Twice his wife had called Pastor Margaret and I asked us to come in person or to pray by distance. He was touched by God. This time it felt different. Mr. Reynolds by now had lost a considerable amount of weight, was shaking terribly in the bed, breathing deeply, <clears throat> gasping. And I just began to speak to him, shaking stop. In the name of Jesus, peace come. He stopped shaking. His breathing slowed down. And I leaned over into him and made eye contact with him, and he opened his eyes just a little bit. Two hours later, he passed into the presence of Jesus. The next day when I went to see Mrs. Reynolds, and before I left, she said, I've got to tell you something. My daughter and I were watching as you were praying for Harvey. And as you prayed for him, a great light came upon you over him and upon Harvey. And that light called him home. So whether you are Mr. Parker, who came late to Jesus, or whether you are like Mr. Reynolds, who was raised in the faith, I invite you to come to the light of Jesus. Perhaps as I've been speaking, a light has come upon you. As I extend the palms of my hand towards you, you may see a light that I don't see, you may see a light that no one else sees. You may see a light from me on the other side of the world coming into the room where you are. Accept that Jesus died for you in your place on the cross, that you can spend eternity with him in heaven. Thank Jesus for dying for you. Ask him to forgive you for all of your sins. Yeah. Holy Spirit, come now. Yeah. Fill all of us in the room with the light and love and your presence, and fill each one who's trusted you today for salvation. If you just received Jesus as your Savior, write to me. Tell me about your decision to follow Jesus. Next week, we'll continue learning 
from the sayings of Jesus. Father, thank you for Jesus, the light of the world. We choose today to live in his light and carry this light for others to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope this message has filled you with living hope in Jesus. If you would like to talk to someone about your spiritual journey, please leave a comment or send us a private message. We enjoy reading your notes and having an opportunity to pray with you. If you received a blessing through this message, please share it with others. We invite you to become a Living Hope Partner by donating as little as a dollar a month through our QR code. Your gifts will help us create new messages and reach more people. Living Hope is a ministry of Ingleside International Incorporated. All donations for Living Hope qualify as a charitable contribution. Thank you for your prayers and support. Next week, we will continue learning together from the Word of God. God bless you and fill you with living hope.